the main takeaway from directing music videos was really that anything is possible. Okay, so, so you're, and, and that's weird to say after coming from Spike's camp. But the little bit about being in Spike's camp is you learned the right way to do things. Because Spike was mm. very much about the right way to do things. And I'm glad I learned that. And then when you got in the music video world, you learned there's other ways to do things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can stretch the envelope. So it was, it was literally like guerrilla filmmaking. It's like, okay, go and rent that, do this, do that, do this shot. And I was able to really experiment with lenses a lot more. Mm-hmm. And I was able to just run and gun with my friends and be like, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Also learned how to negotiate stuff. Because there were times that I shot out in LA and the gangs would come down and shut us down. And we had to figure out, okay, how are we going to keep shooting? First of all, how are we right. not going to get killed? How are we not going right. to die? Okay. And then how can we keep filming right. before real shooting starts? And, you know, I had to negotiate all that. It, it was it was my reverse film school, being a music video director, was like reverse. Mm-hmm. There were no, even editing, there were no rules to editing in, 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 in music video. You didn't have to right. go over shit. You didn't have to do wides and mediums. Do whatever you want. And whatever you want. You have a fan blowing for no reason. No reason. Slap a 10 millimeter lens and see everything. Yeah. And, you know, you know, do a wide angle close up of a person's face stretched out to ears. You know, it was, it was, it was incredible in that way. Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman is a podcast on directing for anybody that's quite simply ever watched anything. Pete converses with a wide range of fellow directors, writers, actors, showrunners, producers, executives, and more on a journey to determine just what makes a good director and why we'll always need stories. Visit www.petechapman.com to get your official director's chair wear, hoodies, hats, jackets, mugs, and other swag, and learn more about your host. Here we go, here we go, here we go, people. Welcome to episode 41 of Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. And today, our special guest is Mr. Jeff Bird. Uh, Jeff is a, a, a good friend of mine, an amazing director, and a candid uh, person with a lot to share. Um, he's currently serving as the producing director on Yellow Jackets season two, which is on Showtime. Um, highly, I think, seven Emmy nominated uh uh, series for its premiere debut season, and I think that they will continue that run uh, from what they've done thus far. Episode two just came out uh, on Sunday, so dive in and catch up uh, if you have not. Uh, before Yellow Jackets, Jeff has had his hands in a variety of television um, from The Flash to Tom Swift to Star Trek Discovery to Good Trouble to Our Kind of People, where he also served as a producing director. Um, so the, the list goes on and on, but he's got a hell of a journey uh, coming out of New York and making his way to Hollywood. Um, for those of you watching on YouTube, uh, you're getting a little bit of a different look here. It's nighttime for me. Uh, I do not have the, the sun blazing in from my, my side window, uh, giving me a little profile light because I am in the middle of prep on Interior Chinatown, episode 107. Uh, it's day two of prep. We've been scouting, driving all over LA. I will tell you, um, for those of you new to LA, uh, become a TV director and that's how you will learn the city because I, uh, we're getting back to the vans as um, COVID restrictions are kind of easing. And uh, that is really the way that I've learned LA by being in a van as we go around trying to find locations or as I'm reviewing locations that are um, being presented to me. I've learned a lot about the city and it is a beautiful one, but that is a convo for another day. Um, Right now, let's get into episode 41 of Let's Shoot with our special guest, Jeff Bird. Roll sound. Speed. The interview. Take one. All right, what's up to the mayor of Vancouver, Mr. Jeff Bird? Currently back in the City of Angels after a nice long run doing a producing director, executive producer job on 
Showtime's Yellow Jackets. Uh, welcome to the pod, man. I feel like uh, this is take two because it is. We tried this before, but we had some internet problems. We did. We did. We did. We tried it before and it was going good until the internet problems too. But this will be better. This will be better. Exactly. Thank you for, thank you for having me, man. This is great. This is, thank you for having me. For just your, your podcast and it is legendary. So, you know, in the directing community. So I, I, I feel honored. I feel honored. There was a time I felt left out. I was like, well, I did not get asked to the podcast. <laughs> and now I'm at the podcast. I feel good. It's one of those, and it's now, one of those moments. Think about how much more you got to share too. I look at like, because I haven't, I haven't recorded one. I said this in the intro. I haven't recorded since July of 2022 because it just got, it got so busy working that it was like, I can't, I can't squeeze them in like I used to. So I feel like I'm going to learn from you on this one and I'll, I'll share updates along the way. But, you know, before I'm, we. I'm, you, man, I'm going to learn from you. Well, have you, wait, have you monetized this yet? I have not. No, this is, this is all for the love, man. I do it. You know, I like to, it keeps me fueled. It was a pandemic passion project to reconnect with folks and the, and to, you know, keep that, keep that community going. But this is, you know, personally funded and, and executed by, by me, along with my man, Tristan Nash, who's producer and editor and Jada George, my assistant and a co-producer. Oh man, dude, you got to monetize this, man, because you've had some great podcasts, some great people on, and you, and all, you know, you're a great interviewer. So it's, 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 you got to monetize this because the beauty of it is, you know, you can do both as a director and, and, and as a, you know, host, you know, and it's just, yeah, you might want to think about it. Monetize right, it. right. Yeah, no, I hear you. Noted. I got a little, my, I got a little my, whiteboard my, right here. Just my thing. <laughs> just my thing. Well, thank you once again. Thank you for having me. Thank you for you know you know taking the time out in your busy schedule and and catching me when I'm in between gigs because I'll be going to Budapest soon. So I'm glad we we caught each other before I you know hopped on a plane and got out of here for a month and a half or however long I'm be out there. So no I appreciate. It. No doubt, man. So thank you. So so before Budapest and before Vancouver, you know, and and I see on your wall you got the Brooklyn Bridge, man. Like, how did it all start? Where did you? pick up that that desire to be in this film game well it all started like brooklyn there and I, I, that's where i'm from so i'm born and raised in brooklyn new york so a lot of people you know say oh i'm from brooklyn i'm brooklyn yeah but i'm born there and raised there and it started with anything in brooklyn in film and tv it started with spike lee and you know spike was you know the guy and you know when i came up he was the only guy and so I started interning and being a production assistant over at 40 Acres and the Mule. And I, you know, would do all the things that an intern and PA would do. I drove, drove Spike around, got coffee, anything and everything that was there to be done. I did it. Now, the funny thing about it is I, I got to give props to real quickly to my parents, my mom and dad, who were instrumental. Mom and dad have been married. They've been married, still alive. Wonderful human beings. Been married for over 50 years. And my dad was, I'm, I'm the only boy, I have three sisters and me. And my dad was very hardcore man's man kind of guy in the military, military trained mm -hmm. in the Air Force. And so he was one of those guys every you know morning would get up at like 5 a.m. and, you know, make sure his son was up with him at 5 a.m. <laughs> you know. <laughs> at what age? Yeah, to make it, 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 as soon as I, two feet were on the ground and I could walk, uh -huh. I was, dad was, hey, you know what? get up, make your bed. I remember my dad would have me make my bed so tight that a quarter could bounce off of it. That was his mm -hmm. military training. So he would flip a quarter and if it didn't bounce off of my bed, off the sheets, he'd rip it apart and I'd have to make it over again. So my dad was very big on discipline and very big on making sure that we knew what we were doing right. when we had to do the thing. It's like, Jeff, you know, you're the boys, so you're going to walk the dog. You're going to, you know, rake the leaves and shovel the snow and do all those things. And, you know, my sisters, you know, would, would hang my mom and do, do whatever they were doing. But my dad made sure I was going to be the guy, the man, the man, man in his mind, uh, you know, be the man of the house when he's not around. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. And in his, you know, in his wisdom, my dad was never a fan of any kind of limitations. I don't care what color you are, there's no limitations. So when I told him I'd wanted to be, you know, in, in the film and TV business, and, and this was way back when I was in high school. And because I remember I saw something on TV, and I saw a guy, a black guy with a camera. 
we were watching some talk show and I saw a black guy with a camera. And I said to my dad, oh, I want to do that. And the only reason why I said I wanted to do that because I thought the camera was cool looking. It was really big. So I thought it was cool looking the way he had it and he was following around. It was a talk show. And he was following the talk show host going up into the, into the you know, stands to talk to the people and come back to his desk. Right. And I'm zoomed by him. You saw the guy, this black guy. Right. And I was like, oh, dad, I want to do that. That looks cool. And he's like, okay. And, you know, then as life went on, I did want to do that. And I remember one day we would go way before my dreadlocks. Uh, me and my dad would go get haircuts downtown in Manhattan at a place called Astor Place. It was Astor Place. Uh, huh. Barbershop. I used, get, I used to get my haircut there when, at my NYU days. Yep. Right there. It's right down the block, right there. So we would go there to get our haircuts like every two weeks. We would go there. And I remember one when we left, we walk, we would walk around Manhattan, we'd go get some food, water in Manhattan, and they saw a film. There was a film crew shooting. And my dad looked over and said, Oh, film crew shooting there. He said, you know what, Jeff? Go and you know, ask one of these people there for a job. Mm. I said, What do you mean? What do you mean? I don't know those people. He's like, Yeah, that's fine. You're just gonna go over there and ask for a job. I said, I'm not gonna do that yet. He's like, and I'm gonna sit right here. My dad pulled out a paper, sat on a stoop, some random stoop in, in, in Manhattan, sat on that stoop and said, well, We're gonna sit here until you do. And he proceeded to read that paper. And I sat there with him for a good hour before I realized he was serious. Right. And I finally got up. And I looked around at the film shoes, all white guys working. And there was one black guy working, there, one black guy. And uh, his name was Charles Houston. I walked over and talked to him. I said, hey, And how old were you at this point? Were you in high school? I, I was in high school. Okay. I was in high school. And so I was about, shoot, shoot, was I 16, 17, 16? Somewhere in there. And I said, hey. So my dad, he didn't care. He's like, you know, he, he, we had jobs. We had literal jobs when we were like 12. Like I had a paper route, you know, you know, things like that. And I was, right. you know, snowed, I would shovel snow. I would shovel people's yards for like $10, a, you know, a yard and stuff like that. And I would come home with $100, $200 after shoveling snow. So I was, all, my dad would always put us into, you got to make money. You got to bring something into this house. So I went over and talked to Charles Houston and he said, look, it was a Woody Allen movie that he was on. He said, look, so this is, you know, we're just doing this Woody Allen pickup thing, whatever. But I work for Spike Lee normally, and we're about to start another film. Here's the number to the office. Gave me the number, and the number I remember still to this day is still stuck in my head. And guess what? It's the same phone number. It is still the same number, the four days in a real number that I have in my head. So I ended up, you know, calling them. They said, oh, yeah, well, you know, we'll come in tomorrow. We're, you know, meeting with people. And I thought when they said meeting with people, I thought it was an interview. Right. And, and my dad was like, and well, when I came over with my dad, the number, he's like, okay, cool. He folded up his papers. Let's go home. And then we left and went home because dad, he was really waiting for that. And he said, we're going to call him in the morning, first thing in the morning. So first thing in the morning, obviously we get up at five, 6 a.m. And I had to wait till nine to call because obviously we're not going to call at 6 a.m. But my dad would always sit there, read his paper. We listen to the news, called at 9 a.m. They said, yeah, come on down. I'm going to have a meeting at Adiata. And I'm like, okay, dad, I got the meeting. He's like, okay, go upstairs, get dressed. So I put on my Sunday vest. I put on my Sunday clothes. Right. And I go down to 40 Eggs on a Mule with my Sunday best on, thinking, okay, this is going to be a great interview. Jeff, just go in there and talk. And, and as soon as I walked through the door, I, you know, you had to ring the doorbell thing and you get approved to come in. As soon as I walked through, there's like a bunch of people, a bunch of young folks down there. And we're all standing around. And I'm like, what's going on? They're like, oh, well, you know, yeah, you're, you're, you're an intern? Come on, just you're standing with these people. And little did I know, it was meeting of intern. It was just like the intern thing. And so you're getting for free. You're working there for free. Now, how many so interns are we talking about here? He had like a whole stable of just... Yes, there was 22 of us in there. There was wow. 22 of us in there at that time. And we, and then, and then Earl, who worked for Spike, was... You know, and then Monty Ross, who's also his producer, were all talking to us and saying, hey, welcome everybody for Hickers. We're going to start to separate you guys out into like what your interests are, who wants to work on set, who wants to work in the office. We went through the whole thing. And I'm right. like, holy crap. And everybody's laughing at me because I'm the only one there in a full on three piece suit kind of scenario. Right. And sure enough, they started me working right away. So I'm been girls looking at me laughing, like, you going to work in that? And I was like, am I working in that? Is there work I have to do? He's like, yes, there's some work you got to do. And so I ended up working the full day in my suit. On what, now what films were being made over there? What era was this of the, of the 40 Acres and a Mule film catalog? 
At that time, it was the Denzel era. So Mobile Blues. Okay. Mobile Blues was just starting or about to start. I worked on Mobile Blues, Jungle Fever, and uh, Malcolm X. And all so the music was, videos and commercials in between. So that was like 91, 92. Yeah, man. Yeah, okay. yeah. Back in the day. It's so funny, man, because I, I used to go, you know, I think, as you mentioned, we all, all roads from almost every Black filmmaker went through Spike. And I wrote about this in my book, how I remember being super young and my parents went to go to New York to see She's Gotta Have It. And I always remember, like, why are why they going to the to New York City to see a movie? Like, what the, what is that about? And then, you know, years later, I think it was 93 would be the first time I saw Do the Right Thing. Mm. And it just clicked. I mean, that was four years after because I was only, I would have been 12 when the movie came out. And so I wouldn't have had the same kind of relationship with it. And then I would go to Brooklyn when I'd make my little sojourns to Manhattan. I'd head, head over to Brooklyn and go to what? One South Elliott place and get me a poster. Yeah. A t-shirt. You know, yep. all that stuff, man. And so he he set that road map like, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, merch and commerce and and all that, man. Like he he paved the way for real. Yeah, he paved the way for that, man. And then and then look at you now doing your shirts and hats and everything. Yeah. And, and your book, everything, man. You, you you also are, you know, ahead of the curve when it comes to that. I, I, you know, I have not been able to get myself together to write a book or and I have ideas for merch and stuff like that. But I love how you, you know somehow you just like find a way during your time working to just create, create your things. And even this podcast. So yeah, you are definitely very much following the Spike Lee, you know, playbook. So way to go. Kudos, kudos to you on that one, Pete. I appreciate it, man. No, thank you. So then, you know, so now it's what, 91, 92, you've done your internship there. Like how long did you stay there? And, and, and what was the first thing that you saw that you were like, yo, this shit crazy. I mean, (laughs) It, it, you know, let me tell you something. It all was crazy. The Spike Lee era was the best era in the world, I think, to, you know, for me to make a film. But it was, it was, it was all crazy because, for example, okay, for example, we, we would do film, we would do, we work on, we work with Spike. And the beauty of it is this, we wouldn't really get paid any money. Like, the internship was really a true internship. Like, basically, what he, what he would give you is tokens. They would give you tokens for the week. So you would get whatever tokens you needed. You get a full stack of tokens to get you back and forth. Even if you didn't take the train, I had a car, so I would. I was one of those kids when I when I when I got old enough. I was like, you know what? My dad was like, you need to be your own man. And right. you know, in my in my eyes, my eyes, even though my dad took the train back and forth to work, in my eyes, being your own man meant you know having a vehicle. It, it, even though my dad had a car too. But I was like, okay, so I'm going to save up enough money, work hard enough so I can get a car. And so I would just take the tokens and pocket and, you know, go back and forth to work. And I'd work on the weekends. Like I would be like a, a banquet waiter on the weekends. I would go to the hotel, the, the, the Hilton, and be a banquet waiter. And I'd make a good, in a one weekend, doing like three shifts a day, mm-hmm. I could make, on Saturday and Sunday, I could make anywhere between five to $600. Easy. That's a lot of money back then. Back then, that was a lot of money. I mean, I mean, that's that's not bad money now if you got a roof over your head yeah, and, no, and, and no food to yep. pay for. Yeah, and that's the thing. I, I had I had that stuff. So the rest all, all was pretty much gravy to me at that time. And and then my parents always supported me working with Spike, so they're like, okay, great. You know, if that's going to be your future, then go and and do that. And he's got to do it. But it was crazy because he was like the only game in town, and they knew it. So when you start out with twenty two interns. Them interns will start disappearing fast because literally Spike Camp did not suffer fools and right. did not suffer people who did not work hard because Spike worked hard to get to where, you know, he he he, he is. And, you know, we go from 22 next week, you see maybe 19 the <laughs> next right. week. It'd be, it'd, each week it'd be whittling down, whittling down, and only the real you know, the ones who wanted to be there would uh-huh. be would be left. And those are the names you would see in the scroll when it says interns, you see the, the name. Those are people that that last right. out of, you know, all the years of that. And some days, some, some, it depends on the movie. Like on Mo Better, it was about, I think it was about 20 something. But once Mo Better came out and Denzel became, you know, Denzel, and he, or he was Denzel then, but, you know, on the next film on Jungle Fever, it was like 50. So yeah. the interest went up like 50 interns. Yeah. 
And and you would think after do the right thing, Mo Better would have more. But I think people were still like, well, yeah, I don't know about this freebie stuff. Mm-hmm. But then mm-hmm. once Denzel happened, boom, Jungle Fever, so many interns, and actually more of them turned into Whitman. There was a lot of Whitman interns because right. they thought Denzel was going to be back. So we had a lot of interns. And then that would whittle down. And then we did Malcolm X, another big list of interns, because everybody right. knew Denzel was back right. with Spike. So they're like, oh, OK, well, we'll, you know, next thing you know, 100 interns. And it would whittle down. Mm-hmm. So it turned into that. The word was on the street every, you know, every every film. And also we would do a lot of those Michael Jordan commercials. So uh, and, right, and right. we, you know, we would we would, you know, roll down to wherever we needed to go, Chicago or wherever to do those Michael Jordan commercials. So the crazy stuff that would happen, I remember I met George Tillman. I met Bob and George, Bob Title and George Tillman. As huh. interns, we were in Chicago. Now, Spike, here's what Spike would do. So he would. And just for up. people, for people who don't know that, that would become State Street Pictures and the movie Soul Food and Men of Honor. What else? And the new Foreman film that's coming. The new out, Foreman new film. film, exactly, exactly. So, so George and Bob. So what Spike would do is Spike had his core group of interns around him. It would be myself, a guy named Lee Davis, and a guy named Van Hayden. Van Hayden's a first AD now. He does a lot of big movies. Lee Davis also directs, and he would keep his core group, our, our core group of interns and production assistants. Now we got raised, we got raised the bar with PA. Right. And he would take us everywhere. So we would go wherever. So he would literally fly us to Chicago to be PAs on the set right. of a commercial or fly us to New Orleans. Wherever he was shooting, whether it be a commercial or, you know, a little doc or anything, he would fly us out to do it. And everybody, the producers would be like, well, why do you need these PAs? You got PAs when you land here. And he's like, no, because he knew we would protect them, number one, and right. know what he wants and how he wants things done. And then he would hire some local PAs when we got to the place, but we would, we would be the bosses of those PAs. Right. So when we got to Chicago to do this Jordan commercial, we had to build this. For some reason, we were now the art department. So we had to build a, a, a pyramid of... Air Jordan sneakers. And what happened was we had to tie every sneaker. So Nike brought tons of sneakers to the hotel in Chicago. We were staying at the, the, the Four Seasons or something. So wherever Spike stayed, we would stay. He would just get right. a big suite and we would be in a regular room. So they brought all these sneakers to our rooms. I remember we met Bob and George came to the room as well. He, Spike hired them to PA. And we would literally stay up all night tying up Air Jordan. <laughs> we were putting the laces in the sneakers and right. tying them up and putting them back in the boxes so that when we got to the set the next day, we could build this big ass pyramid. Right. So we got no sleep. We literally sat there tying it. And I said, we met Bob and George. And I love Bob and George. They were like, so they were doing that. And we went to set the next day. And, you know, we did the commercial, we met Michael Jordan, which was great. And you know, took some photos with him and stuff like that. And then after the after the production was over, we thought, okay, Craig, cool, cool. No, so they brought all the sneakers back to the hotel room. We had to untie the sneakers. I was about to say, don't tell me you had to untie them. We had unlace to untie them. the sneakers, unlace them, and put them back in the boxes. <laughs> so we sat there all night untying the sneakers and putting them back in the boxes. And I remember we were talking to Michael Jordan. And he he knew, so Spike told him, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, they kind of And I remember we were like, well, we, do we get a pair of sneakers? And, and Jordan's like, no. Yeah, I could get a pair of sneakers. <laughs> nope. You want paper pay for a pair of sneakers? We're like, we don't get a pair of sneakers. Mike, come on, Mike. He was like, nope. But what he did do, which was kind of, which was kind of amazing, is he, and I, you know what? I feel awful about this. So he gave all of his interns a hundred dollar bill that he'd signed. A hundred dollar bill. And, I, and, then, and as a kid, that was, I was, that was my first time ever seeing a hundred dollar bill. I didn't even right. know there was such a thing as a hundred dollar bill. And it was, you know, and it said Michael Jordan. And I remember when I brought it home, my dad was like, oh, we got to frame that. We got to keep it. That's, we got to frame that. And I'm thinking to myself, it's a hundred dollars, dad. I want to spend this right, money. Right, right. And I, I think I ended up keeping it for a little while, and then I ended up spending it, cashing it in somewhere. And I feel so bad about that, because if I would have kept that to this day, it probably would have been worth so much money. Or you, did, you should tell people you bought your first camera with that $100 bill. The, and, you know. <laughs> that's a great story, because mine is tragic at the end. And I just, I just, 
cash it in. I was like, yeah, give me some money. Right, right. Somebody's got that, somebody's got that under the bill right now. Probably, you know, framed like my dad told me I should have done. My dad, my dad, always oh, super smart, super smart dude, way ahead of his time. And, you know, I, if he was living in this era, he probably would be a billionaire right now. Just because he was, just, he's, he's just really smart. One quick question too, like where where's the family from? Like like did they did they northern migrate from the south or like where how they come to be to Brooklyn? You hit the nail. They, they migrated from North Carolina. My mom eat in North Carolina and my dad is Winston Salem, North Carolina. Okay. And actually, and they're back there now because they retired and I moved them back to North Carolina after I think it was after 9 11. You know what's interesting too? Because like my 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 mother's from Virginia, my father's from Alabama. And as you get older and then they go back to like where they are from, you realize the city person that you grew to know as a kid was never really a city person. You know what I mean? Like they were always from the South making it, you know, surviving in the big city. But then you see them in their natural habitat and it's like, oh, you really from Virginia. Yep. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? And it's, it's really yep. interesting to watch that, that evolution in time. It is amazing. Now, now the thing about it is with my dad, my dad knew that he didn't want to stay in North Carolina. So he was mm -hmm. like, you know, and once he got into the service and he saw the world, like they had him stationed in like Greenland. He would tell stories about Greenland. He was like, Greenland's so cold. And you spit, it was freeze, and bounce right back to the bench. <laughs> and he's like, you know, and then he would tell me a story about Greenland and Iceland. He told me the story. That's the first time I ever heard about, the, you know, Greenland and Iceland, why they named Greenland, Greenland and Iceland, Iceland. Mm -hmm. Is because Greenland, you know, Iceland, they didn't want people to come there. So they, they wanted to name it so that people thought it was really cold. Although Iceland is actually really nice and Greenland yeah. is terrible. Greenland is, is like, you, my dad tells stories of Greenland, it's ridiculous. But, you know, he, once he, his, his eyes were open to the world when he traveled in the Air Force. And he boxed Muhammad Ali in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. You know, he was, you know, he was, a, you know, they did a, a, ex, a, a little ex- what is it called? An exhibition? Uh, not, yeah, a little exhibition thing. So it wasn't like, you know, a real super duper fight because obviously mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali could beat my dad. Mm -hmm. But it was just like my dad was into boxing as a, as, 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 a, as a youth, as a kid. Right. And he did that in the Air Force, too. So, you know, they, they did a picture of him and Muhammad Ali, you know, on the deck of an aircraft carrier, you know, in, in their boxing stance, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah, that's great. So, yeah, so they, so my so my dad when he knew when he when he left the the Air Force, he's like, you got to move to the city, got to get out of here. Although they're back there now, but they knew they had to get out of there. And my dad was always thinking forward, even though all my my aunts and uncles were still in North Carolina, but my dad was the main one left. My my aunt Ruth left, but she didn't go as far north as he did. She went to Washington D.C. Mm. all the way to New York and and mastered New York. And then now he's, you know, him and my mom are back in North Carolina, mastering in North Carolina, because we got a lot of properties there. Thankfully, my family has property on both sides. Right. So I know, so that, that's why I wanted to know, because I asked you that, because I know that it fuels how you move and who you are, you know. Yep. For, so after learning kind of what production could be, right, and, and commercials are great. And back then, man, they were probably doing 19, 20 hour shoots. Oh, care, my God, ridiculous. You know, there was, like, there was no, it was ridiculous. There was, was no such thing as we're stopping or, oh, we got to have a meal, meal penalty. Right. No, there was so none 12 of that. hour day. No, that yeah. don't exist. Oh, did um, not exist. What was the next step for you, man? Was it college? Like, how did you, what was the next step in your career? Well, I was actually going to college while I was working with Spike. I was, thankfully, I went to the school in, in New Jersey called Gramical College. It was it's up, upstate New Jersey, mm -hmm. like not too far from Buffalo, New York. And I would go back and forth. So I would then luckily have my car. So I would drive down and I was still working. And finally I dropped out. <laughs> and finally I dropped out. I was like, you know what? I can't, I can't keep doing this. Cause I had a football scholarship and I got a concussion and mm -hmm. I was like, I can't play football no more. Cause what position were you playing? I was middle linebacker. Mm -hmm. I was middle linebacker and I was good. But I remember one game, my, my coach said, hey, so listen, we're, we're facing the, to the, whole, to the whole team, we're facing the best fullback in, in our division. And Jeff, you can't tackle him alone, so everybody's got to gang tackle this guy. And, you know, you can't tell it to somebody like me right then. Back then, I was like, I'm, I'm going to take him on myself. I'm going to take him down myself. 
Right. And that's exactly what happened. At one point in the game, he was coming down the middle and I was right there and crack. And we both fell down. He got up. I did not. And I was out for a little bit. Mm. And, and it took me to the hospital. I had a concussion. And they were like, well, you know, if his brain swelling doesn't go down, we're going to have to drill some holes in the skull to relieve wow. pressure. And there was a whole talk of that and keep him awake. They had to keep me awake for like 48 hours and then bring me back and give me another MRI. It was a whole big deal. Damn. And yeah, and that's why I knew this was not for me. I did not want, I was not about that life. And especially <laughs> since, you know, at Randall College, we're not a division one school. I wasn't going to be drafted into right. the NFL. So I'm like, what am I doing this for? So I, you know, pretty much dropped out and, and went to, you know, work for Spike full time and did that. And then what ended up happening was the funny thing about it is how I transitioned into directing was I really wanted to be a DP. So I was really good with the camera and good with lighting. And I really, really, really wanted to be a DP. But then a bunch of friends of mine, they got record deals. A bunch of friends mm -hmm. of mine became rappers and they got record deals. And music videos started happening. And a lot of them were like, well, you know, well, you know, we need a music video director, Jeff, and we, we just said you're going to do it because you work for Spike Lee, so you must know how to do something like with the camera because you work for Spike. So, you know, we can't have Spike do it. They never, you know, agree to that, but, you know, we told them you're going to do it. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Said, you're going to do our video. We talked to Russell, Def Jam. They said, yeah, so you're going to direct our video. So I went, I remember talking to Spike one weekend, or one during the week, and I was like, Spike, you got a second? You know, my friend wanted me to direct this music video. What do you think I should do? He was like, you should direct the video. He's like, do it. Any help you need, let me know. That let Earl know. And we got stuff in the basement, the 40 acres, there's cameras, there's lighting, there's gel, there's all the equipment down there that you need to do whatever you need to do. Right. And and then like I remember on like Friday, on like a, a Thursday, Spike had, you know, whenever we would shoot, you know, Spike would say some stuff before we before we go into shooting day. And he had said, everybody gathered around and he said, Hey, so just just so y'all know. You know, one of our interns, Jeff, Jeff, where you at, Jeff? Raise your hand. And, <laughs> but he's doing a video this weekend. You shooting this weekend, Jeff, or next weekend? This weekend? All right, so he needs a crew member for that. So if y'all want to volunteer, you know, let Jeff know and work on the video. And everybody from the crew was like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it for free. It was yeah, like man. rips, electricians, everybody who get paid on Spike's set came down to work for me for free on music videos on the weekend. It yeah. was insane. It was such a supportive group of people. And then they would show up on Monday, back to work for Spike. Right. And then they would tease me and be like, Jeff, you ain't our boss no more. So just go over there, give me a call. <laughs> you know, but the, I think the driving thing behind that is that at that time, even more so than now, like we didn't have a voice, you know, and as far as representation with our own images. So I can imagine people were like, I'm in, man. Like what you need, you know, 10 hours, 18 hours straight, whatever sure. it might be. Like, Let's bang it out and let's do some good work. And I, I, I see from your list. I mean, was, was just kicking it for Escape? Was that like the the first one, or was that was that... the first one? That was their, okay. that was their first music video. First, that was their first big song. That was their biggest, their biggest, their big song, their biggest song. So yeah. that was that was that was amazing. That was amazing to work on that and, uh, with Jermaine and all those guys. It's it, it's been it's it crazy. I had to work with Malik Saeed. I remember Malik. Saeed, for those of you who don't know, Malik Saeed's a DP slash director. And, you know, if you need any more information about him, I'm sure people will tell you, can tell you. But Malik was also on Malcolm X. Malik came and worked in the electric department of Malcolm X. And he and I became really tight, close friends. And on the weekends, we would do the, the videos. And he would be my DP. And, you know, we would, we would just rent out cameras sometimes just to go and shoot stuff. I remember, mm -hmm. I remember the first time we did a music video in Atlanta in the middle of summertime. And we rented out a steady cam. We rented mm -hmm. out a steady cam package. And we didn't have a steady cam person. It was just he and I would we we strap it on and learn how to steady cam. So and then that's people, people take courses for this, but yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but we did not. We just rented out the unit and figured it out. And I remember it was we were shooting in some club in Atlanta. And I forgot which group it was, some rap group, and, it, and a bunch of girls in there. It was hot. And I remember we were shooting. He had the unit on. And at one point, he just fell over. Wow. He just fell over because he because he got overheated and fainted. Because it was just like, we were both dripping sweat. Sweat was dripping. 
So you can't do that now. Like he just said, you usually have to, you know, pay to take a class before you can get that. But back in the day, they were like, oh, okay, you, you want the unit? Great. Here, take it. You, you got the money to afford to rent it out? Take it. And that's exactly what we did. But that's that's kind of how my directing bug started. Mm-hmm. And then how I got to to Los Angeles, how I got here to Los Angeles was pretty much, you know, from the director from from music videos. I remember F. Gary Gray and I met mm. in New York. And well, wait, can I ask you one more one oh, more thing sure. about the music videos? Cause I because you know, it's like so you did Escape, you did you did Nas, you did Naughty yep. by Nature, you did yep. Gangstar. Like, yep. what would you say was the the main takeaway? from music video directing? And this could be two questions. Like what was the main takeaway? And, or what were you able to take from that to apply toward TV and film? And then I wanna hear about F. Gary Gray and and all that. Oh, wow, that's a great question there, Pete. The main takeaway from directing music videos was really that anything is possible. Okay, so so you're, and and that's weird to say after coming from Spike's camp, but the little bit about being in Spike's camp is, you learned the right way to do things. Because Spike was mm. very much about the right way to do things. And I'm glad I learned that. And then when you got in the music video world, you learned there's other ways to do things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can stretch the envelope. And, and I was like, oh, we can do this. Oh, we can break the rules that way. Oh, we don't have to have a DP like an Ernest Dickerson. We can do it ourselves. Or right. as long as we learn what the F stop is and what the, you know, and, and how to manipulate the shutter and do all those things. So it was, it was literally like guerrilla filmmaking. And it was the ability, even though, you know, Spike is a guerrilla filmmaker from She's Gotta Have It days, like, mm-hmm. like you said, with your mom and dad. But as he progressed, he learned how to become the filmmaker that we know that knows the rules. And also right. he knows when and where to break them. But he also, he sticks within the rules. But in music video, there are no rules. There's like nothing. It's like, okay, go and rent that, do this, do that, do this shot. And I was able to really experiment with lenses a lot more. Mm-hmm. And I was able to just run and gun with my friends and be like, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Also learned how to negotiate stuff. Because there were times that I shot out in LA and the gangs would come down and shut us down. And we had to figure out, okay, how are we going to keep shooting? First of all, how are we not going to get killed? How are we not going right. to die? Okay. And then how can we keep filming? Right. Before real shooting starts. And, you know, I had to negotiate all that, like with, right. with, with, with the gang folks and, you know, in different areas. And so it really, you know, I really got it, it was it was my reverse film school being a music video director was like reverse. Mm-hmm. There were no even editing. There were no rules to editing in, 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 in music video. You didn't have to right. go over shit. You have to do wides and mediums. Do whatever you want. And whatever you want. You have a fan <laughs> blowing for no reason. No reason. Slap on a 10 millimeter lens and see everything. Yeah. And, you know, you know, do a wide angle close-up of a person's face stretched out the ears. You know, it was it was it was incredible in that way. Yeah. And then I was able to take that into, you know, my, my first feature and the short film I did. And it it really helped. As a matter of fact, the short film I directed, I shot over here in LA. I shot down at the train station over at the downtown LA. Or Union. Union Station. Yeah, yeah. And the reason why I got Union Station. Is because I shot a music video there. And mm-hmm. Union Station is so beautiful, as you probably know. Oh, yeah. it's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful location, and it costs a crap load of money to shoot there. Right. And they got to shut up areas if you want to shoot. So I had this big music video we shot down there. So we, we did all that, and I got really tight with the guy that ran Union Station. And he would come on the set and be like, oh, Jeff, I'm laughing. I said, hey, so you know... I got this short film script and it'd be great. You know, if I could shoot it here, it's, it, it takes place at a bus station. I can turn this into a thing. He's like, oh, no, said, how many days you need? I was like, well, like four. <laughs> and he's like, four days? I was like, mm, yeah, four. And I got no money, really. It's a solo budget thing. I said, you can't do it. He's like, no, you know what, Jeff? You've been good. You guys spent a lot of money here, so we'll work it out. And then uh, we'll shoot there. I, he let me shoot Union Station for four days with no money. Yeah. No, no, no fee, no nothing. And God rest his soul, he's, he's, he's passed away now, but he was an amazing guy. He used to run the station and he, you know, for films and, and for music video stuff. And he literally did it to me on the slides. Like, don't tell anybody. Right. Anybody know you shot here? Obviously, they're going to see. But when they, if they ask you, tell them you paid right. X amount per day for the shoot. And I told them, I paid like, I told them I paid like 25 grand a day for the, for the thing, you know, right. but I didn't. You paid nothing. 
So that's kind of, you know, Spike Lee thing is kind of what got me into directing. And what I learned, what I learned about the music video was anything is possible. Mm-hmm. Anything, mm-hmm. anything is possible if you really, you know, if you, if, you, if you know what you're doing with the camera and you can break a lot of rules, but then also don't break your crew. Yeah. Don't, don't and, break. And, the, and the, I joked at the, in, in the beginning of this, but like, I'm also seeing that you've been mayoring for a while. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, that's so important, man, like to to kind of know that there are ways around things. And that doesn't mean it, it, it's like criminal, but it's like, you know, people people like to be acknowledged. You know, people like to know that well, I'm now I'm now I'm being redundant, like to know that you see them, that's acknowledged. But like yep. there's something about being a real person. Like for instance, man, like, and this is your interview, but I'm thinking no. <laughs> about like when I was doing my feature, I, I wrote it at a gas station because I worked at a gas station. Now, then you start thinking, I need a gas station. And you're like, well, I got to shut them down, right? And that means, you know, I remember when I worked, I'd, I'd have on the weekends, I'd have ten to $15,000 go through my hands, you know, and that was one shift. So you got to at least, you know, shut down, replace that money. And so I went to a gas station in Bayonne that had been found at Bayonne, New Jersey. I get out there, I go, I, I rap with the brother, my name, his name was Jeff Sizmaluski. And we chatted, man, and I kicked it with him for like an hour, just in the chair, you know, how he had the chairs in the in the driveway. Yep. And he was like, you know what, man? I got to go on vacation anyway. I'll go on vacation when you want to shoot. And they gave me the crazy discount rate to shoot there. And then we also had a car that gets into an accident. And he was like, ah, I'll get a door from an, a junkyard. You know, you get a Honda Accord. Okay, I'll get another gray Honda Accord door from a junkyard. I'll switch it off. You know, you can bang the shit out of that door. And then I'll take it off and put the other door back on. Rental place will never know. I mean, that's amazing. You know what I mean? That is incredible. That is but, incredible. But that's but that's like knowing like you gotta sometimes you gotta be the you gotta be the oil man to get these things to align. Yes, you do, and you gotta you know like you said before. I mean the whole that whole merit thing, which is interesting. A lot of people call me that, and, and I love that. And because my dad, my once again, my dad taught me that. My dad, it it, it comes inherently from my dad. Because my dad, I would watch my dad, you know, kind of maneuver, mm-hmm. you know, through situations and through racism. In mm. the South, like, because we would, so <clears throat> we would live in Brooklyn and I was born there, but we would go every, every summer and, and Christmas, we would go to North Carolina. We would drive 13 hours. My dad never mm. flies. So we would drive 13 hours from Brooklyn to North Carolina. And, and it was a family trip. We loved it. We all like in the car going out and we'd always get pulled over and, mm. you know, and the cops were always pretty much racist. Once we got to Virginia, once you got past DC, yeah. yeah, you're like, okay, here they here it comes. And my dad was always ready for it. My dad, military, he had all this stuff ready. And, you know, he didn't care, you know, that they called him boy. He would never, he'd never bat an eyelash. Mm-hmm. He grown ass man, but they called him boy. And I remember sitting, I remember being awake one night because my dad would always tell us all to be quiet. My mom would sit there. And yeah, I listened to them, kind of belittle him. And my dad answered, it, yes, sir, no, sir. Yeah, we're just, just we're doing, sir. And he, he, but he dropped into his military training, right? So I could see him dropping into character, literally. He didn't know that that's what he was doing, but he would drop into character. He drop into his military character. And say, yes or no, sir. So he, their racism did not penetrate him, mm-hmm. and they would let him go, and we we would drive on because obviously we were doing nothing wrong. And then he would turn back into the father that we knew about, you know, a mile down the road away from them Hmm. and you know and then talk to us about what just happened and he was not shy at all about you know sharing about that and telling us that's how they grew up in North Carolina had to deal with that growing up in North Carolina so like you said I learned a lot of that from him in regards to I would watch him get us into places without reservations I would watch him Hmm. get us into like you know six flags you know, without paying, he had friends. I mean, it was, it was amazing the, the wheeling and dealing my dad would do just based off of charm. And, you know, like you said, seeing other people and acknowledging those people mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and looking them right in the eye and saying, hey, I see you. And you know what? 
I see what you're doing and I compliment you on the job that you're doing. And he was, right. he meant it too. He wasn't like, you know, BSing. He, my dad smoke, was yeah. And the same thing with me. I, I, you know, you know, the guy at Union Station took care of us and he was great. And, you know, and the same thing with, you know, our DSS group, you know, it's just curated for a reason, you know, so that it's, it's people that, you know, I know and like and respect and respect their work and respect them as human beings. And that's, you know, that's what, that's what I want to surround myself with. So, and that's also what Spike teaches too. So the right. reason why you're there, Spike will whittle you down. Right. The reason why you're there is because Spike believes in your talent. That's the thing. So, so now take me, take me back to meeting F. Gary Gray. Now you're in LA and, and, and now what's going on? So actually I was still in New York when I met F. Gary. And what okay. happened was we were both shooting videos. There's, a, there's this one alleyway in New York that a lot of videos shoot at. <clears throat> and I mean, there's a lot of alleyways in New York, but there's this one that's known for video shooting. And I was supposed to shoot there. And so was he. So I, uh, yeah, and that's the first time I ever met him because we both showed up at the same time. But production, mm -hmm. both productions showed up at the same time. And it was, it was funny because it was kind of like, you know, we met in the middle of the alley <laughs> and we were like from opposite ends. And I like, knew. You know, Yes, it was very much like that. And we were like talking like, okay, so well, you know, we have, and we both had permits to be there. It wasn't even like, you know, but, and that was the permit office's mistake. They both, they permitted us both on the same, same weekend, same day. So we agreed we're going to share the alley. So I went and shot something else. Well, he shot there and then I came and shot and he went and shot something else. And then we were both trying to get this, you know, sunset shot because you can see through the alley, you can see the mm. water. So we were both trying to get that. Well, so anyway, so we got to know each other and like each other. He was like, you know, you need to, you know, come to LA and, and, and direct for my company. I got this company, FM Rocks, that I work with, and you should come and direct for us. I was like, nah, it's good. Thanks. It's good meeting you. But at that time, I was like, mm, I don't want to move to LA. I was straight up Brooklyn, UK all day, every day. <laughs> and I thought moving to LA was a sellout move. I was like, I ain't going to LA. That's crazy. That's for sellouts. I, I'll shoot in LA and come back home but I'm not going to move there. And right. sure enough, he had the company call and they called me and they was like, look, you know, F. Gary, you know, loves you. And so, you know, we're going to, we want to bring you out. I'm like, well, you know what? I don't have a, I don't have a car. Or well, we'll get your car. I was like, well, I don't have a place to live there. And he's like, well, we'll get your place to live. I was like, well, you know, <laughs> so they, I said, look, I'll try it. I'll come out for like, you know, six months. How about that? I'll do that. And we'll see how that goes. And I, cause they basically, you know, I couldn't say no. And right. I, Blew me out and put me up, and I had this really beautiful apartment. First, I started at the Shangri La. They kept me at the Shangri La, which is down in in Santa Monica, overlooking mm -hmm. the water. So they were seducing me that way. Yeah, and you were like, "This ain't half bad. This is okay." Amazing. And then they got <laughs> me a convertible Mustang, and I was driving around the top down in December. I'm like, "This is amazing." It was it was beautiful outside. I'm like this right what it is right now, but. LA is beautiful in the wintertime sometime and and it was incredible. And I totally got seduced. And then then they moved me out of the Shangri-La Hotel to an apartment that I wanted in Hollywood. It was a penthouse apartment in Hollywood and had at the two floors and access to the roof, private. Uh, this is a commercial production company doing this? Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Yep. Commercial music video production company doing that. But all, all because that's Gary said so. Yeah. If I'd have been just regular Jamal off the street, they probably wouldn't have, they wouldn't have done not even probably, they would not have done. But okay. it's only really because of Gary said, you know, this guy's good. And so then I had my boy Van, Van Hayden, who I told you about. So I had him come out and he stayed with me in the apartment. So we both we both had the apartment and because it was big, it was huge. So I was like, OK, I can't make this place by myself. And then we'd have parties there. We'd have all kinds of things there. We'd have, the, you know, Oscar parties, just any parties and people would come over. And, right. And, you know, I met John Singleton. Well, I met John Singleton back in LA. I mean, New York when he came down to Spike set. We were doing a video for Prince, and John Singleton came to that video set. But then in LA, he and I really got to know each other because he would come to the parties that, that we had at the house. And I met the huge brothers that way. You know, wow. everybody would come to to the crib and you know have the party. So I was also being the mayor back then, Pete. Hey man, look, I, I love not, it. <laughs> I love it. So that's how I came to LA. And, you know, I will never, you know, forget Gary for that. He's, he's, he's the main reason. And, and, oh, you know, I miss those days actually because F. Gary, man, such a cool dude. He was doing the really the biggest videos out at the time. He was doing like waterfalls and he was doing, I mean, as right. far as videos are concerned, the big, the big directors, obviously there's Hype Williams, 
who was, you know, a good, good, good friend of mine from back in the day. We both started at Classic Concepts together. And you got F. Gary. And of course, you got Benny Boone, Chris Robinson. Um, well, Paul Hunter. Well, you got definitely Paul Hunter, who I was met over at, over at FM Rocks as well. So it was mm-hmm. myself, Paul Hunter, F. Gary. Chris Erskine was there as well at one point. Darren, Darren was Darren there? No, Darren was there. Darren was Darren Grant was at another company. But that, so so there was a nice group, you know, of us. Oh, Tim Story was also at FM Rocks with us mm-hmm. as well. So Tim Story was there as well. So there was a nice group of us, and it was it was it was very much you know a bonded a bonded experience because we all would be like, "Yo, man, did you shoot so and so's video? Did y'all get shut down? Did the crypts come down or the bloods come down that day?" Right. <laughs> we would all we'd be comparing notes on who got shut down by who that guy. Right. And so then you you went to you know, we'll, we'll kind of land this plane in the TV conversation, but you went to film from music video, correct? I did. I went to film from music video and that's so funny. So the the funny thing there is our, so I did this film feature wise. So, so I did a short film and that won a bunch of awards, got me a deal over at HBO um, for two years. Uh, I won the American Black Film Festival when HBO was giving out their deals. Was that breakdown? Yes. Okay. So I won with and what, that. What was that about? Did you write it? Did you just yes, direct it? I, okay. I co-wrote. I co-wrote it with my writing partner. It was basically. It was based kind of on a true story, but I embellished one. Okay. And I'll tell you why. Basically, what the, the movie is about. I got Vanessa Williams to star in. And what ended up happening was the, the 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 film is about this young lady who tries to get out of L.A. She tries to get out of L.A. and take the bus, and she's trying to. You know, we end up finding out. As she's, you know, going by a bus, there was some big robbery of a bank and and all the buses, everything is being stopped from going out of town, the airplane and stuff like that, you know, and she's in this, in this, in this uh, bus station and gets, gets hit on all, all, everything that can go wrong in the bus station happens to the point where at the end of the film, end of the short, she pulls out this gun and shoots everyone. Turns out she was one of, because they're catching, there's like four mm. people at large who robbed the bank. And they're yeah. catching them. And you can hear the radio where they catch got this one, got that one, got that one. There's one left that they couldn't catch. They can't see like the fun. And it turns out it's her. And she shoots everybody up. In, and they track the cops. The cops track down, okay, maybe it's a bus station. And they get to the bus station and they say, come out. And at that point, she's shooting up everybody. And she shoots up the whole place. And the cops start shooting inside the place. They just start shooting willy-nilly. And basically what happens is she's the sole survivor of the shootout. Mm-hmm. And she, so she puts a gun in somebody else's hand and she has this big bag, a black bag, and little dude, they know it's full of money. And they think she's just an innocent bystander. And she lived through it. And right. she's the only witness really to the cops shooting into the bus station. Right. Because basically an investigator comes down and says, hey, well, you know, you got shot in here with no problem. You know, you got unprovoked shot into the bus station and killed everybody. And we got to get her out of here, put her on a bus, get her out of here. And they put her on a bus, and then one one cop, as she's about to leave, one cop comes and comes running up to the to, to the bus station to the bus door where she is. She's like, "Oh shit, I'm gonna get I'm busted now." And he hands her the bag full of money and says, "Hey, you forgot this. Your name's on huh. this." And she takes the bag and gets on the bus, and the bus goes away and drives. So the bad guy got away with it. She literally, and that was always a, a dream of mine. Like, you know, how many bad people actually get caught? There's a lot of right. bad people walking around these streets. Oh, without a doubt. I love this you know, idea. So that won me the, the HBO thing. And then fast forward, I did this feature film called King's Ransom for New Line. Mm-hmm. And, but I also, before that, I did a film. Before that, it's so funny. Before that, I had my rise was always steady upwards. I right. did this film called Jasper, Texas with John Boyd, Lou Gossett, and Joe Morton, which won a bunch of awards as well. But that was made for Showtime. It was a feature for Showtime's M- MOW, what they call back then an MOW, movie, movie of the week. Right. And so then I finally qualified to do kind of a feature. And that feature flopped. Pete, did James it flop? James Ransom. And that's Ransom. 2005. Oh, my God, Pete. That film flopped so bad. And I remember being in feudal position on the weekend and my, my agents and everybody calling me. Everybody was trying to make sure I didn't, you know, do anything rash to myself because I was literally in tears over that movie. And mm. that's when I got put in director jail. So to speak, because you know all the things about. Oh, don't worry, Jeff. We'll do another one. Don't worry, your next one will be better than this. Da, da, da. You know that's what they say. Right. Even New Line, like, oh, don't worry, we're gonna. You know, I had a two picture with New Line, but never did the second one because the first one tanked. 
So yeah, I got in at the director jail. I was on the, the, the list and I could not get a job. And I just kind of, you know, it was upset for a long while, but then I started heading towards television. Mm-hmm. And now, what's Felicia, a long, what's a, what's a long while? It was years. Yeah. It was years, Pete. I feel like this is a, a recurring theme in most people's, well, not most, but in a lot of careers where it's not an overnight thing, where you're multi-talented and dabbling, where you can find something to dabble in, you know what I mean? And then you have that little that little valley period where you're trying to figure out what the hell is going on and who you're going to be and are you cut out for this? And, you know, and then you come out on the other side. So it was it was several years of, of that several. feeling in that negotiation. Everything you just said, Pete, everything, several years of that. And it's interesting because, like you said, no one really talks about that too tough. That's why I love, mm-hmm. you know, your podcast. I love this, 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 this medium here that you've created because people have to hear it. It's, it's a real mm-hmm. deal. I mean, it's, and, and also people have to hear it because you shouldn't feel like a failure. Right. Even though, you know, your film may not have done well, it doesn't mean you failed. It just means that that thing did not do well you yourself personally are not a failure, but you feel like that in the moment you feel like you're a failure and you feel like things will never, you know, either be the same or you'll never be able to come back. And and that's why it's important. It's important to have, you know, a network of people have a group around you that can either a, a can smack you out of it and be like, look, you're not a failure. Just, you know, shut up and get back on your feet. Right. And, let's go. and one of those people was Milson Shelton. Milson Shelton kind of, you know, did that for me. Like I said, I'm sorry, good. I was going to say, we had her on the podcast too. So if you haven't heard that episode, yeah, you can dig back into that. Another Spike Lee origin story as well. But yeah, I could see. uh, And I shadowed her on Ballers. She was one of the few people, man, like who, not even a few, like I shadowed her. And on a Saturday, she reached out and she was like, are you getting everything you need to know? And then we talked on the phone for like a half hour and, you know, you observe directors as an observing director or, or a shadow, as they like to call it. And a lot of times, like, you know, you the most thing, the thing you become most familiar with is the back of that person's head. You yeah. know what I mean? So I know I can only imagine she was super helpful to you. Oh, my God. I mean, well, see, she and I go way back. So, you know, and I mean, to New York Times, New York days. And New York people, we have, you know, we have tough love. Mm-hmm. So if you're if you're wallowing in self pity, New York folks will be first one to say, "Hey, you know what? You just, what are you doing? You're an idiot." And you know, East Coasters do that. So she did that. The two people that risked mental nap for me in that regard was Millicent and Rob Hardy, her director Rob Hardy. So if you folks don't know Rob, look him up. And Rob is amazing. You should. Did you get him on the podcast too? Did you get Rob on the podcast? I have not, but he was like you said, like you're talking. He was somebody that I think Kelly Edwards at HBO connected me with him, and we just wrapped on the phone for half an hour while I was shadowing, you know, just so I could know how to not make a fool out of myself on a set. Well, Rob and Millicent poured into me. I remember my sister was the one who called Rob and said, "Look, Jeff needs help. Can you do it? Can you sit with him?" And Rob and I went out to sushi. And it, 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 a three-hour sushi session. He was like, Jeff, remember who you are. You won, you know, the American Black Film Festival. And you, you know, we came out. We were looking at you at the bar. Him and Will Backer. I remember meeting him and Will back in the day when they did Chocolate City. And mm-hmm. we were all at the film festival together and stuff like that. And I was, I, I won the short film category. And then when I came back the other year, I won the feature film category. So, like, he reminded me of that right. lineage. And... Millicent was the one that gave me the tough love. Like, listen, if you don't get over here and shadow me on this show, we will mm-hmm. not be friends again. We will not be friends. I will, un- you will not. And it's not even like Facebook unfriending or whatever. It was right. literally like, you will not be my friend. And I ended up shadowing Millicent on the show called The Fosters. Uh-huh. And Millicent, you know, every time like they'd be on, the, you know, Millicent was so great in that regard where, you know, the executive producers and people would come by and they were like, oh, who's this? This was before shadowing was really a thing that was mandated. Right. And, and she just had me on set, sitting behind her in a chair. She'd like, she had me in the meetings. No, 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 Jeff, he's coming into the meeting. And, you know, I would come into all the meetings, read through everything. Everybody like, who right. are you? What are you here for? Oh, I'm Nelson's, you know, shadow. So the executives would come up to me and they'd be like, so you want to be a director, huh? 
And Millicent would walk by. He is a director. And Millicent would make me sit in her chair at the monitors because she would never sit in her chair. She hmm. would go and be by the, the minis, right close to the actors. And so her, her chair at the-, the it was empty. Video, in Video Village was always empty. Yeah. So she said, Jeff, sit in my chair at Video Village. I'm like, I don't want all the executive producers, everybody's here. She's like, no, sit in my chair. And I would sit there and she would go by every now and again just to hear what they were saying or whatever. And mm-hmm. one of the producers was asking me, so you want to be a director? And Milson walked by and said, he is a director, actually, he is. And then she, <laughs> she would keep going. <laughs> and, right. and then I remember one of the producers, Chris Sacani, who I love. I love Chris Sacani. Because she ended up hiring me on, on another show. And so, so Chris would say, Chris sat there and she said, so she looked me up, she pulled out her phone and said, Jeff Bird, right? She looked me up, IMDb me, and she said, this is you right here? I'm like, yep. She said, you did this movie, this one here? You worked with these people? You, you did this too? You did this? You did that? Yep. And then she'd get up from her seat and she walked over to, I remember her walking over to Craft Service where the other EPs were. Mm-hmm. And she was showing them, she was literally showing them the phone and she's pointing over at me. And she was showing them the phone, yeah, point back at me. And then all three of them walked over to me. And I'm like, oh crap, they're going to kick me off the set. And she was like, and they were like, why aren't you directing our show? And then Millicent mm-hmm. walked by right at the perfect time. I told you, you should be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was, it was, it was amazing. It was amazing. So then, you know, I never got, I never got, you know, to direct the Fosters, but I ended up directing the, the spin Good Trouble, Good Trouble. And that is where, you know, Chris was like, Dr. Jeff, so I've directed Good Trouble. I directed about five episodes of Good Trouble. So it's it's all it's all that. It's like That's beautiful. Having your your group of people around you when you do hit a wall to help you get over it, to literally offer their back so you can step on it and get a leg up. And that's what it is. That's what it's about. Hey guys, I'm Kaylee Cuoco from The Flight Attendant on HBO Max. And you are listening to Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. Transitions. A Director's Journey and Motivational Handbook is Pete Chapman's book from Michael Weasley Productions. What started in 1993 has been a marathon of persistence and creative pivots, transitioning from indie filmmaker to teaching at NYU's acclaimed film school, to running a production company, to directing television and commercials, and ultimately eyeing a return to the feature films that gave him a start. A mixture of how-to, self-help, with inspiration. This book is for any person targeting a successful career in the creative arts. Transitions, a director's journey and motivational handbook from Michael Weezy Productions is available on Amazon and anywhere else you get your books. Don't forget about your local mom and pop shops, people. Was Good Trouble the first episode that you directed? No. So before that, I, I skipped over one very important piece. So before that, I directed a bunch of episodes of Soul Food, the series um, mm-hmm. with Felicia Henderson. And once again, this is another, because I was only doing features at that time in my head. I was only doing the movies. That's what I wanted to do. But Boris Kojo and I were best of buddies right back then. And Boris was like, Jeff, you got to come and direct, you know, direct my show. And I'm like, what show is this? You know, oh, oh, you're talking about, oh, Soul Food, the spinoff of the movie. He's like, yeah, you got to come direct it. I was like, they're never going to let me direct that show. And he was like, no, nah, no, nah, you got to come direct it. I'm talking to Felicia. I'm talking to Felicia about it. So then he got me the meeting with Felicia. So I went and got the meeting with Felicia Anderson, and we met, even though Showtime at the time was like, no. And yeah. it I was on the list. Right, so it was right, no. right. And because my movie had flopped. So it was it was like a no-go on the, on the soul food. But then Felicia vouched for me. So, but I didn't even know any of this until afterwards Felicia had told me. Because because I remember when I was directing my first episode, she was on set every day sitting behind me with a laptop and she was writing scripts and stuff. And like, oh, wow, I wonder why she said, I, 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 well, I thought, well, she must do that with every director that comes, she must be on set. No, the mandate was, if you're going to have Jeff direct an episode, you're going to have to be on set and guarantee his episode, you're going to sit there every day. And they were hoping right. she was going to say, no, I'm not going to do that. Right. And they were like, well, he can't direct. But she agreed. She said, yeah. And she didn't tell me that until way after right. that, that that was the case, that it was like, yeah, they only agreed if I, you know, sat on the set. And I was like, oh, my God. And the funny thing about it also was I almost lost that job. Mm-hmm. I almost got fired off that job. 
And I'll tell you how, real quick. Um, I almost got fired off of that job because I was coming from film and music video and all that stuff, whereas director is king. So, but in TV, obviously, you know, we know that the showrunner, the head writer, the writer is king. And in this case, Queen, Felicia Henderson. So I remember when I first got the job and I first ever had a tone meeting and I didn't know what a tone meeting was. And, and Felicia's assistant, Demica, called me and said, hey, so Felicia wants to do a tone meeting, but she can't do it during the day because she's working all day. So she's going to come by your hotel room and you'll do a tone meeting there. And I was like, okay, great. And they got me this really beautiful hotel room in, in Toronto where we're shooting. And it was like a big suite. And so Felicia would come over and I'm thinking, oh, okay, we're just going to, you know, I'll order some food up or some drinks and we'll just sit and tone. And I had, at the time, I had a very jealous girlfriend who would call me incessantly whenever I went out of town to shoot something. And I had to pick up the phone or else. And they were all, oh, you're cheating on me, blah, 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 blah. So in the middle of the tone meeting, I kept answering my, my cell phone. I kept going, oh, okay, okay, okay. I go to the next room. And I remember the second time I answered it and I came back, she was packing up her stuff. Oof. And I said, oh, are we done? And I'm ignorant. I'm, I'm oblivious. Oh, we're done. Okay, cool, cool, cool. She's like, yeah, yeah, we're done. And she's packing her stuff. And she said, okay, well, I guess I'll see you tomorrow. And she's like, mm. and then she left. And I'm mm. like, okay. And then so immediately, so like 10 minutes later, Demica calls me and said, Jeff, what did you do? I'm like, what are you talking about? Did you answer your phone during the toll meeting? Did you go in the other room and answer your phone? I was like, yeah. Was, you know, my girlfriend calls. I want to make sure she was cool. Did a real thing. She, she's like, oh my gosh, she just told me to, you know, see if about getting you plane flights out next couple of days. And yeah, I was like, what? She said, listen, here's what you got to do. So tomorrow morning, Felicia usually gets in here around 8 a.m. Start wow. You get here at 7, but go to this place first. Go to, she loves donuts from this place. Go buy flowers from that place and, you know, and get this kind of coffee from this place. And these are all places that she loves in Toronto and then have the driver bring you straight here. And I did all that and sat in her office, hot ass coffee. So when she walked in the door, my right. pad out, ready to take notes on this tone meeting. Right. And she looked over at me. Then she looked over at Demica. Then she looked back at me and she said, <laughs> and that's because I became good friends with Demica. That's what the assistants, man, they can save your life. Yeah. Do yeah. not disrespect assistants. Do not diss them. And they are the gatekeepers to all of the information. You would have came in there with, with a croissant and a tea and and a and, and a and a rock garden without Demica. You know, or I would have just been sent home because <laughs> Demica didn't have to save me. She didn't have to. Right. She would have been like, okay, let me look up some flame flights. Right. She, she didn't have to, but Demica, I became really cool with Demica beforehand. And I was always nice to her and good morning, all the things. And yes. just treating people with respect will save your life sometimes. And that's what happened. It it it, it kind of saved me. And then, you know, we became buddies. I apologized profusely and so I didn't realize my first episode. I didn't know. And, you know, and from that moment on, you know, it was all about soul food the series. I ended up doing like 12, 15 episodes of Soul Food, the series. It paid for my house. It paid for my, my, my first house ever bought in LA. Soul Food, the series paid for that. Wow. So it, it was pretty amazing. And thanks to Boris and her. So it's, so it's all about, like I said, about having a group. But that, that was like 2001, right? That, yeah, was, so that, that was, was pretty before, early. That, so yeah, that was before the movie. Sorry, that was before so that the movie. So there was kind of like a little bit of a time, like it, it seems like you were doing the TV, but... You know, especially in that in that day and age, it was like, but I'm going to make films. You made yes. the film. It didn't do what you wanted it to do. Yes. And then you were trying to find your way after the Valley back to directing and TV was the road. Yeah, and, Mil and, Mil and Millicent brought you into that. That is correct. You're right. I totally forgot. Soul Food was before King's Ransom. And, and here's the thing about that, though. The thing, interesting thing about the Soul Food scenario was that I only, I never saw myself doing TV, even when I was directing Soul Food. For me, I was just directing Soul Food. So mm. I never really got agents to get any meeting for other shows, mm -hmm. any, any, any mm. real thing like that, except for one show was Crossing Jordan. It was mm. Crossing Jordan. And I was supposed to direct an episode of Crossing Jordan, but then I got Jasper, Texas. And when I got that, I said, oh, well, I don't, you know, let me get me out of Crossing Jordan because I want to do Jasper. Right. It's a thing. 
And I remember the Crossing Jordan producers were like, no, you agreed to do our show. And we got a signed contract. And even though you can, you know, I'm sure you've done it before too. You can drop out of the show. Obviously, if you have something medical happening, you drop out of the show. And also, this is well before the show was to shoot. And right. I also ended up um, getting a replacement, a director way better than me to direct my episode. And they still were like, nope, you're going to do our show. And if you don't do our show, you're on the list. And right. I ended up not doing the show. And I ended up going on that list. And yeah. So, and, and I remember sending that producer flower baskets and edible arrangements and all kinds of stuff. And he did not accept my apology. Mm. I, I just, you know, and that lessons you learn. Yeah. I wonder if someone had maybe gone to that with particular fervor and then they were having to say, Oh, forget everything I said. And, 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 and had a little egg on their face or whatever. I wonder, I wonder what the reasoning was. You're probably right. I think it was probably something like that because I don't think at that time I was even, you know, qualified for, you know, crossing Jordan. And it was the same, it was, it was the same producer who also produced uh, heroes. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So I was going to do an episode of Heroes after Crossing Jordan. Of course, the Heroes episode fell through as well. So, yeah, I think you're right. I think it was probably the, I put my word out for this guy. Mm-hmm. And now he's dropping out. So then, so then, all right, so then let's talk about the last, I'm going to say, I don't know, from 2017 or so, right? Like the quad yeah. and... Like, so from that, the last six years is like the the rebirth of Jeff Bird as a TV it's, director. Um, you are correct. I tell love me how, how that. I love how you, I love how you pen that, the rebirth. I love that. The rebirth of cool, you know? Like yes. how, how <laughs> what's been that journey and, and what have you applied to it with all of these other feathers that you've acquired in your cap along the way? Well, you know, it's funny you ask that, Pete. I was really was, you know, for me, and this is an odd thing to say, but I mean, in terms of the medium of film and TV, but I really learned to love television. I, and, I act to, and I actually, you know, have turned down features because, well, there's a little bit of fear still in me, especially comedy. I will never, I don't think I'll ever do another comedy again in terms of features for sure. I won't, I won't do that. And I even tend to stay away from comedic TV shows just because mm-hmm. it's so subjective of what's funny and what isn't. Whereas in drama and thriller and horror and stuff like that, you can, you know, you know, and, sci- and sci-fi, which I love, mm-hmm. all, those, all those elements, which I love, you, you, you know what's going to scare a person right. across the board. Uh, and also, know, too, with, with these features, it's like there's a, I, I, I talked about this with, with my close circle when I get a script and I'm like, you end up wearing the feature... I'm making this analogy up on the spot, so it might not be elegant, but, you know, making a TV show is like passing out a flyer. Making a feature is like putting a fucking sandwich board on, right? Because yeah. it, because you're saying, it, or people assume you are now saying, this is how I view the world. This mm-hmm. is the kind of stuff that I want to make. And like, when you do a TV show, it might you might find yourself in one particular character or, or or in one scene in an episode uniquely, or sometimes it's a really one-to-one connection with who you are and the stories you want to tell. But like it's the it's the showrunner's thing, it's the direct, it's the creator's thing, you know. But when you put that film out, it's almost like and Jeff Bird's new view on things or latest take on life <laughs> is yep. this movie, and that's a thing that you want to tread carefully with. Definitely want to create you. And now also, it's so funny. I, I, I was listening to this YouTube the other day, yesterday, in regards to Marvel now. And Marvel, they're looking at, there's, you know, phase five and, you know, the whole vibe behind that from the bosses is accountability. The same thing now with Warner Brothers, accountability, mm-hmm. which means basically if you're directing for them, you're accountable now mm-hmm. for the film that you made as a director. You're accountable for that. They don't want to hear no excuses. They don't want to hear nothing about, well, you know, the executive down the hall and around the corner suggested that shot or this 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 story arc. Right. So they're going back to old school era of filmmaking, meaning right. you know, director is king, so you better you you better make it good. 
Right. And you're right. It is that. It is a sandwich board around your neck. You're walking around with versus like the flyer that you hand out and say, yeah, you know, yeah, there's subways down the block and you can there if you want to. I, I make a good sandwich there, but there are a, a bun- there's a bunch of good sandwiches there. So, you know, feel free to come and eat all the right. sandwiches. Whereas you got the board on, you're like, you, I'm the guy. Right. I'm walking around. I'm the person now. You know, trust me. And mm-hmm. you're right. So, you know, so I, for me, television is now the thing. To answer your question, your original question, it, it's for me, it's TV. And I really, you know, what I've learned over the years is I want to be able to bring what I've learned and all things in my toolbox to the table in television. And, and as a PD, I was just talking, you know, I had a Zoom earlier with an executive about, about this very thing. I was asking, well, Jeff, do you want a PD more now or do you want to be, you know, directed to go from show to show to show. And I said, really, I had to answer honestly. I said, you know, I want a PD. I'll do a couple of shows in between if you do. But I really want to be PD, which is, you know, for those who don't know, producing director, which is what Pete and I have been on different shows. And we get a, you know, a co-EP title scenario. And for me, it's it's the reason I, I answer it this way. I, I love the fact that I'm part of the team throughout. I get to see it all happening. And I get to affect change. So mm-hmm. if I know this production designer is whack and needs to be replaced, I can get rid of that person or this location person or this PA or, or the craft service people. Because mm-hmm. the journey person director is coming in going, oh, I had a terrible time on that shoot because of that person or because right. of this thing. Right. I can never get rid of that person or this thing right. for them. And that way right. the next that comes in and be like, well, you know, when I was there, that person, that, that person wasn't there. Yeah, because right. Jeff got rid of that person. From your experience, I saw it and I got rid of that person. And it shouldn't just be, and I, and I love the fact that the industry has PDs now, as opposed to just line producers doing the thing. There's the hand in hand of a producing director who's right. boots on the ground. And it's not just about the money. It's also about the interaction of humans and yeah. watch the interaction of humans and can address negative and positive interaction without always it having to go to HR. Because they right. try to never that anyway. HR is in some <laughs> office somewhere. Right. And when you call HR, it's really not going to help. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. You should if indeed something's heinous. But there's a lot of issues your PD can handle for you in right. the moment as opposed to waiting and documenting and sending HR this letter or calling, dealing with all this stuff. Obviously, HR is there for a reason. I never would say get rid of HR. That's nothing I would ever endorse. But right. there are a lot of interpersonal and crude things that can be handled that the PD who's sitting right there watching. And I've seen it happen. I've seen the PD activate. I've seen Chris Fisher, who was the producing director on Star Trek Strange New Worlds. I've seen him deal with some stuff right in the moment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, racial stuff too. I've seen him deal with some stuff right in the moment. And literally like, wait, who did what? That person? Boom. I think right right to that person and handle that thing. Right. It's amazing to, to, to watch. Right. And so at this point, you know, how how would you since we're talking about being a producing director, like, you know, that's obviously something that you take great pride in being able to affect change and elevate the 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 vibe on set and the community on set. Right. But like, what are the what are the challenges of that job? Well, the challenges of that job, that's a good question. So the challenges of being a PD are very much so based in interpersonal. Oh, for example, okay, I bring up the line producer. So a lot of times the, the producing director is a new, it's, all, it's, it's only arrived in the past three to five years. And line producers usually occupy the entire- Is that, is that in, in, in title or just in position at all? Because I feel like I've, I've seen directors be- EPs on shows, but maybe not have that. Exactly. Which yeah, really, okay. So it's basically in title. There have uh-huh. been directors like Paris Barkley, who's been an EP on shows. Uh-huh. And but all but 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 Paris was never really quote unquote producing director, so to speak, even though he stayed on the show and he was an executive producer as well as right. director of the show. But for some reason, Paris never was really considered a producing director. He was higher than that. So he okay. was always up there. Whereas kind of like in the area that you and I kind of, you know, uh, occupy, it's like this producing director. You come in there and you're hired specifically for a certain purpose because they know the live producer got their hands full on other things, right. which, or, or, they, or they should. 
They should have their hands right. full balancing the budget, making sure the budget is staying on point. Right. Whereas the producing director, we're equal. What a lot of live producers don't like to re- don't like to absorb mm-hmm. is the producing director and the live producer are equal. Right. The line producer can't fire the producing director. The producing right. director can't fire the line producer. We're right equal. Only one who can fire us is the studio and the show runs, the big right. bar. But the we can't fire each other. We just look at each other with daggers or with love, <laughs> depending upon depending upon what you develop on the set. But one of my biggest, I think the biggest obstacles is finding ways to work with the line producer. Because line producers, you know, they feel like their 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 territory is being you know, infringed upon a little bit. Right. But what they don't realize, I've seen really good relationships like Tunde over at Star Trek Discovery. He's got a great situation and, and a, a great relationship with his line producer. And his line producer, when I did Star Trek Discovery, I remember I had in the office right next door to the line producer. And I would see him coming in, he'd ride his bike to set. It's so funny, he had to bike behind you there. He would ride his <laughs> bike, he would ride his bike to set. And I'm, I'm a big bike rider myself. I'm gonna have a bike ride after three of them. And I ride for miles and miles and miles. And so I saw his bike and I was like, oh, I got one. I got he had a trek. I have a trek. And we talked about that. And, and I was like, yeah, I had a trek before, you know, I, I, not just because of Star Trek, but because I like the trek bike. And, you know, he just had such an easy life because he would just take care, take care of the money and take care of the stuff. And Tune Day would take care of a lot of the creative stuff with the with mm-hmm. Michelle Paradise, who's a showrunner. And, you know, Tune Day would be boots on the ground. It was such a great experience to see how they him and the line producer worked together and how no one butted heads. It was just like, you know, it was smooth and easy. Right. And what I want. So I keep searching for that. I keep searching for that. And when I did Out Kind of People as a PD, me and the line producer, eh, we were, we were okay. Eh, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't the greatest. It, it wasn't the greatest. I will, you know what? No, it wasn't, it wasn't the greatest. I will admit. <laughs> I will, but you know what though? Like sometimes there's nothing one can do about it, you know? Like True. I feel, I feel like some people have, you know, I, I would put you in this category. It feels, you know, weird to say, but I feel like, like I, there aren't many people I don't get along with. And if somebody don't get along with me, I feel like they got something going on. Cause, yeah. cause I'm, I'm not giving you something to, to have a problem with, you know yeah. what I mean? And so when you run into them, to those situations, like you just like, it is what it is. And you just, you know, look at the rap date. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. Um, I have a director specific question for you because, you know, in my experience as a PD, I, I was able to have affirmed for me some of the assumptions I may have had about why certain folks might have found it hard to work consistently, you know, like character types that you might find, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what is it that you, I don't know, let, how about what are like the top? three things that you would see in directors as a director yourself, but as a producing director above them, so to speak, on a show that were clear signs as to why they would not be invited back and or find it hard to be hired somewhere else? That's a very good question, Pete. And it's a, it's a, it's a heartbreaking one too, in certain regards, because, you know, you and I both, you know, having doing the, doing this job and having done this job and going to do it in the future, we would love to hire, you know, a bunch of people, our friends, you know, people we admire, stuff like that. But a lot of times people will make it hard. And the reason, so for me, the three things that you asked, you're being, A, number one, being prepared. Mm-hmm. Number one, I think a lot of times what ends up happening is folks do not come prepared because because a lot of times people think, okay, well, I'm going to make it up on the day. And that's very dangerous. Do not, <laughs> do not, do not make it up on the day. Do not, right. not make it up on the day. Do not get into this filmmaker, you know, mindset, independent filmmaker mindset of, you know, well, you know, we'll just make it happen. Me and the actors make it happen when we get there. Well, we're right. just, so preparation is, lack of preparation is one. Lack of a personality. Mm. Is, Speak is number, to that. Lack of personality is number two of uh, reason why people are going to ask that because, and it's a slippery slope. Number two, personality is a slippery slope, meaning, you know, Paris Barkley, you know, has this, 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 it should be a book, but he has this list of things that uh, directors should and should not do. And it's a great list. If you ever get in DG, if you're in a DGA, you ever, you can go search it out. He's just, he does, he has a video on it. And one of those things is be careful in the scout van. 
because in the scout van, everybody has conversation about that. You talk about everything from politics to, you know, race to, you know, what you ate for lunch. Right. And if you do not have the personality to navigate those conversations, then, you know, sometimes you won't be asked back. I mean, it's that simple. And my thing is, if you don't know how to navigate that conversation, the best thing Farrah says in his thing is just be quiet. Just don't, just right. don't, just don't, don't right. say anything. Don't offer up your opinion on something if you do not know how to navigate your I personality. Got a, I got a little aside on that. I, I, had a, I had a meeting with Paris, and this was for a particular show. And he was like, he, he pointed to the wall of headshots, right? <laughs> and he was like, who should we get rid of? And I was like, oh, shit. how am I going to answer this question, right? Exactly. Because I'm like, because you're asking me something that you mean. You're just asking it in a way to see how I take the bait. And yes. so I was like, you know, and I thought about it for a second. Probably felt like 10 minutes, but I thought about it. And I was like, well, you know, that's probably above my pay grade. But I can tell you who I think could be used more or used better. You know, and I then I went into a little bit about smart. those two that's or three characters. Pivot. You know that's what I mean? Pivot. But like that's but that's exactly the thing. Every every conversation is a trap door, is a pitfall, yep. is quicksand. It got a it, there's a grenade under that that yeah. chair in the van. <laughs> like you you know, and you and so you you make a great point. You said you said, but you called it lack of personality. Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah. Because I thought you were going to take that in the direction of like not having a sense of, like not bringing like a particular energy to that's to part of it too that's okay. that's part of it too i was going to get to that part too so it's okay. correct it's a twofold scenario like a personality gotcha. it's twofold and then it's that part too the energy scenario and also in the energy portion of the personality so the first part of it is you know navigating conversations uh -huh. and then the second part of it is what energy do as what personality do you bring to to your set Mm -hmm. And also, does that personality go in line with the show that you're directing? Man. A lot of times, you know, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a loud, as you can probably tell, I'm a talky, talkative guy. I warn everybody before I even, you know, go into stuff. <laughs> hey, you know, I'm talking to them. I'm, I'm loud. I'm, I'm from Brooklyn. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to have an opinion. I'm going to say something about something. And I, But also the beauty of me is I will apologize and I can see where mm. I can, where I stepped in something and go, oh, okay, you know, I need to make amends for that thing. If I stepped in it there, I'm mm -hmm. not one of these hardcore heads. It's like, no, nah, I don't ever do nothing wrong. I'm, 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 I'm right all the time. Right. So what your personality is when you bring it to, when you get on the set and if it falls in line with that show, I've seen people who have very soft, soft-spoken people mm -hmm. not be asked back to shows where there are actors who are very big and gregarious and have big personalities and yeah. want that in their director. And they want to be, you know, really guided in a mm -hmm. big way by their director. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these, some of these actors and number ones want to feel like they, you know, like they're working with Coppola. You know, even right. if you're not, want you to exude, this is what right. we're doing. This is how we're doing it. Learn, you know, camera's going to go here. We're going to do this. And then, then I'm going to come into this. I remember on the set, one of the actors when I was doing Star Trek Discovery is telling, no, uh, it's Strange World. And talking about working with this director on a, on a feature, and he was telling me the story about what the director said. The director was like, I want, you know, when he, he was listening, he said, the DP asked, oh, no, the camera operator asked, so what, how would you like me to cover the shot? He's like, I want you to move at the speed of sorrow. I want to push in at the speed of sorrow. And the, you know, the, the actor was very impressed by that. Yeah. Like, wow, what is the speed of sorrow? And it's like, it's like, you know, that's just a director thing to say if you are smart right. and firm in your personality, because you can right. laugh that by saying some stuff like that. Right. But everybody in the crew knew, oh, got it. Speed is off. <laughs> they was like, no, a little slower. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. they accepted it. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, that, that's, you know, that's a thing. And then I knew that's how he wanted to be directed. And I knew, mm. okay, this is, this is how he, in particular, he wants his direction to come from a creative space, not mm -hmm. from the space of, oh, how many shots you got? And right. what are we doing over here? We're doing this. And I could see that whenever I started to, whenever I mentioned or whenever I talked about it in terms of shots and how many, because there are certain actors asked me, asked me, they would come on set the first thing, Jeff, how many shots in the scene? Right. So they wanted to know when they were going home. And they're right. like, Jeff, how many shots? And I would tell them how many shots. And right. he would be listening over there. And then whenever, whenever I went over to him, I would say, 
So here's what we're gonna do. It was, it, it was you know, uh, Anson Mount from Star Trek. Right, right, World. right. And I love Anson. Anson's amazing. He's, you know, and he's very much, you know, an actor's actor. Mm-hmm. And you have to come from, come at it from a creative, creative place with him. And, but also you have to move efficiently. You have to be efficient. He's number one, you know, on the call sheet for a reason. He doesn't want to be there all day for no reason. So you have to move efficiently. But the creatively, he's very much locked into the creative space. And you can tell that that show, you can right. tell. It, 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 you know, well, both of those shows, Star Trek Discovery and Stranger Worlds. But he's very much locked into, you got to come in there and have a creative choice too. Not right. just, here's how the shots we're going to do. And I'm just going to throw it that way. No, right. you better be creatively locked in. Right. So those are two. So two. Those, so so for preparation, personality, these things you don't get asked back. And I think the third thing is for me is also you know post. I'm in a meaning post production, meaning being amenable to finishing your cut in the four days that we have as directors to finish it in, and also are, trusting. Are people not doing that, or 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 do you mean they're giving cuts that you can tell like it, it peters out because they they clearly didn't finish going through yeah. it. That happens. Yeah. That happens quite a bit, and also they're giving cuts that are just like sometimes you know seventy five, eighty minutes long. You're like, wait, what? Why would right. you deliver an eighty minute cut? You didn't. You weren't thinking about the thing. And and it's, so that happens a little bit. And I think also what ends up happening also in post is that you know people want to be involved further, mm-hmm. meaning, oh, can I come to the mix? Can I do this? Can I do that? When. In reality, you should trust the showrunners. It's their show. It's their show. And, mm-hmm. and just be like, okay, I delivered my cut the best that it can be. I got it down to a certain... Also, have notes in your cut. Have right. notes in your cut and have different ways of doing your cut. Like, whenever I do a cut, I make sure I tell the editor, hey, so this is the script version, but also let them know I have an alternate for this scene. Right. And right. show them my alt for this scene. And then show them, you know, this other stuff that I have. For, yeah. each, for each scene, I may have an alternate. And I may have a shorter version because that's amending their script. You should definitely right. have that both. You should have the scripted version mm-hmm. and then have your version too that then the editor can pick up and go, oh yeah, this is what Jeff had here too. And this and then I always get calls from the showrunners about it. They're like, oh my God, thank you so much for having that cut. I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't have thought to cut that whole scene out. Right. And, and, you know, and sometimes they'll go with that. They'll take the whole scene and just boop, and just take it all the way out. Right. So have that, but don't become bothersome. Meaning. You know, it's their show. Like you said, also, it's a showrunner show. It's a writer's show. Let them go with it. And obviously keep in touch by the assistant. Mm-hmm. You know, if you become friends, if you became friends with the assistant to the showrunner, you know, send them emails. Hey, how's it going? How did, did they like my cut? What do you think? You know, how's, this, how's the mix going? Do you, do you think they need my input on the mix? Right. And then if you became friends with that assistant or close to that assistant, they'll say, no, they don't need you. Oh, actually, you know what? They, we just talked about the other day. You know, maybe right. you should just put so-and-so an email. And that way you become the go, they go to you as opposed to you bothering them, knocking on the right. door. Hey, right. when's a minute? Hey, when you're doing this? Hey, can I see another cut? Can I see your producer's cut? Can you guys send me that? They're not going to send you the producer's cut. Right. Like, right. You're, you're one of 22. You're one of 10. You're one of eight. Yeah. No, that's, that's all great. That's super accurate advice, man. Like, what, what would you say to anybody listening particularly to get into episodic to you know let's just say let's make a profile of this potential person there you know let's say they, they they've had success in the doc world or they've had success in the in the commercial or music video world or you know features but they now they want to move to this place where it's kind of getting harder and harder to get into because yeah. you know certain doors are closing even though the volume of content is 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 increasing yeah. Like, what would you recommend to that person to try and build a career or transition rather into a career as an episodic director? Wow, that's a tough one. Um, so how to transition in their career into episodic? It, it, like you said before, I mean, you covered the bases pretty well in regards to it's getting harder now. And mm-hmm. a lot of the diversity programs, sadly, are going away and, and also lessening. So I know Apple's doing a diversity program and they're going to have three participants. Sony is revamping their 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 program because Sony used to have because you were part of the Sony program, right, Pete? I morning. did Sony. That was the first one I did. Yeah. How many people were in that? There were now. Let me get this straight because there were I think it was fifteen. There were there were five three groups of five. There were two 
drama groups and one comedy group, if I'm not mistaken. Mm, did I did I come down to speak to your group when you were there? No, I was in the I was in Sally was in Sally Richardson Whitfield was in in the group I was in. In the group and, and Slick. That's how I met both of them. And so Slick. look at that. That was 2015, and now here we are, almost look eight years later. You know, everybody working, all of y'all working. So Sony's gonna whittle down their program too. So it's not gonna be 15 anymore. So they're gonna mm -hmm. they're gonna whittle their down to like five. Mm -hmm. So uh, and then and then I heard they're gonna kind of phase it out altogether. So a lot of these programs where they used to have a bunch of different, you know, a bunch of different participants are going to whittle them down. So it's getting harder and harder. You hit the nail on the head. It's getting harder and harder to get it. So my advice, because we hired Liz Garbus, who's a doc director. You brought up doc directors. Liz Garbus, who's a documentary director. And we hired her to direct an episode of Yellow Jackets. And she did amazingly well. Liz mm. was extremely ready. She was extremely prepared. You know, her personality was on point with everything. Mm -hmm. There was never a conversation that Liz wouldn't be able to have and navigate. And when she was on set, she literally knew, she was like, like Bruce Lee says, be like water. Uh -huh. She flowed, you know, uh -huh. if, 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 if an actor was very talkative, she became talkative with that actor. If an mm -hmm. actor was quiet, she respected that actor's privacy and quiet time. Right. And, you know, and she delivered an amazing cut and post. Her post, her post flow. I mean, now this is huge now because of that, she did that Netflix doc with Harry and Megan. Yeah. And, you know, so she's huge. So, you know, we can only hope to get her back next season, but she really, you know, delivered. And I, and also Liz was able to really, you know, connect. It's a, a lot of it is about, you know, realizing who does the hiring. Mm -hmm. and figuring out a way to connect with those people, you know, or that person and being able to either sell yourself or you have a meeting or get your agents to have a meeting with that person and sit down. It's all about trust. How are we, we going to trust you with these millions of dollars that right. you have? And you have to develop trust. For me, okay, let's, I, I'll talk real quick about that with Tunde. So Tunde over at Star Trek Discoveries, before he was there, he was a bunch of different places, but he did this show, this show with Steven Spielberg called, what's it called? Falling Skies. Okay. And I wanted to direct that show. And I remember meeting with Tunde. I said, Tunde, you know, it'd be great if I need an episode. And I'm really, you know, I think I'm ready. And Tunde straight up, you know, you're not ready. And said, but here's how you get ready. And he took me on my, on the journey. He said, you know, those CW shows. Now, sadly, the CW shows are, are become a thing of the past. But he said, you know, those DC CW shows, Jeff, you can get any of those shows, start to put stuff like that in your resume. Then, you know, I can see you for stuff. Mm -hmm. And I remember then after that, he got Star Trek Discovery and I wasn't ready that first season. But at one point, I guess he had been following me and following my trajectory. And he called and said, Jeff, hey, are you free for lunch? I'm like, no, I'm sorry, not even lunch, breakfast. He said, are you free for breakfast? I was like, sure. And he, he said, well, 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 what day? I was like, well, this day. He said, well, where do you want? I'll, I'll come to you. He said, no, 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 I'll come to you. So he came all, I was in the Porter Ranch at the time. So he came all the way to Porter Ranch at breakfast with at like eight in the morning and broke it down. So look, we've been following you, tracking you, as I told you, we would. And I had done a bunch of episodes of The Flash, Black Lightning, Runaways for Marvel, uh, right. two episodes of that. So I've been doing the green screen work and right. all the things, the biz effects work. And he said, you're ready for, you know, you're ready for Star Trek. So I'm going to have, have a meeting over at, over at uh, Secret Hideout, which I did. And apparently, I guess I hasted it. And I got an episode of Star Trek Discovery off of his, you know, his, his, him pushing for me and then right. following, following me and tracking me. So it's also about that too. I think if you're going to, nowadays, as you, as you spoke about earlier, their premium television is what they're calling it now. And they're hiring less and less directors for that because they want it to feel like a feature. Right. So if they're doing eight episodes, they're hiring maybe, you know, two directors or maybe right. four directors. They're doing them in blocks because it feels like a feature. And also, when you're working with actors and the caliber of like, you know, Kevin Costner over there doing Yellowstone. Right. And Helen Mirren and, and, and Harrison Ford. Now all these people, they're used to doing features with one person as at the helm. Mm -hmm. And TV knows they can't, it's, it's hard for them to do that, but they want less people the better for a guy like Harrison Ford, who's going to look and go, okay, I'm standing at this peak today and it's peak mm -hmm. tomorrow. And it's Pete next week. And right. you know what I'm saying? And, you know, Pete next month. And then, oh, we switch over to Jeff. And now he's right. Jeff. Oh, okay. These are my two directors, Pete and Jeff. This is all I got. These are all the two names I remember. 
Right. Great. <laughs> and these are the two guys I trust when I got an email. And now, now, nowadays, things are heading more in that direction. And because these big stars are heading to TV and they don't want to have to see a new director every day in their face, every episode, right. they don't see a new director in their face. They want to see, you know, somebody they can trust and they can call and hold responsible. Hey, you know, that last episode, Pete, you know, I don't feel like we really, you know, hit it out the park. So this next one, let's make sure, you know, let me know what you need from me. Right. They want to be able to have those things. So if you're new coming into the game, really hit the ground running. First of all, find out those shows where you can really hone your craft. And they may be smaller shows on smaller networks, but believe me, it'll it'll help you to then step right. it up to the bigger stuff. Right. That's awesome, man. It's, you know, I like to, in my documentary days, because uh, I used to live in that world too, pretty specifically, I would always ask, is there anything I, I haven't asked you that you'd want to share? And that could be about, you know, directing or about something inspirational to, to listeners who are, or, you know, paying attention to the podcast here. But uh, anything that you would want to, any wisdom you want to drop, man? A couple of things. First of all, first of all I want to uh, thank you, Pat. Yeah, also, uh, I want to, you know, thank you know, I mean, my biggest accomplishment to this, to this day is, is now is now is Yellow Jack. So I want to thank Jonathan, Ashley, and Bart, the showrunners of that show. We call them Jab, along with Drew, their producing partner, um, you know, for hiring me and giving me that shot. Because I know it, it was their, their names were the ones that that backed me in regards to being a, you know, producing director on a show as big as Yellow Jackets, seven Emmy nominated show. So I know, you know, it wasn't just, me and my, you know, self that got that job. Right. Um, so I, w- I want to thank them. I want to I also just, you know, a- a- inspire everybody to read your book because it, it, there's a lot of gems there. And I hope you do a follow-up to the book, you know, because I've, I've recommended it to people, you know, read it myself. And it's like, you know, hopefully you do more books and demystify a lot of this stuff and allow people to see behind the curtain. A little bit. And for those, and it's funny, I don't know if you experienced this also, but it's interesting how like I'll do panels and stuff and I'll give out my email address or my phone number hmm. and it's be a room full of people. And maybe I'll get two calls or three emails or whatever. Right. It's amazing how many people say they want to be in the business, but when the rubber meets the road, mm-hmm. they are scared. They're nervous. They don't want to call. They don't want to reach out. They don't know. They're not sure about themselves. Yeah. They ain't have a dad telling them to go ask for a job. They, and yeah. that, I, I mean, I'm being facetious, but that's true. Cause, cause you know who does holler at me all the time? People with ill thought out direct messages <laughs> on Instagram or Twitter or whatever. And it's like, dog, like, I don't know you and, you, and, and add something professional to this. Like do it in a way that at least is honoring the fact that like, you know, as far as this appears, like we are on, we're, and I, 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 I'm just going to say it, but like, we're on different levels in this right now. You yeah. know what I mean? Like if I'm reaching out to Spike Lee, he on a different level than me. Like I'm writing that email different than I am to somebody else. And yeah. when people come into a particular way, it's like, well, you're letting me know that I can't even bring you into this world because you didn't dip your toe into it in the right spirit. Yep. And, you didn't and, arrive with the I thought I'm telling you, you drop gems all the time. I'm telling you, I love that about you because that's important that people need to know too. How you approach a person, how yeah. you email a person. And also, I love that you said that too, because a lot of people don't think that way in regards to I I, I you know I call it the totem pole, the hierarchy, the totem pole of who's above you and right. how you treat that person. You treat that. I treat like I'm with you. I treat Spike differently yeah. than I treat, you know, people in my peer group. And yeah. I, I, I treat, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, listen, I even treat F. Gary Gray differently, mm-hmm. you know, be, even though we are friends, even though we're cool and we came up together in music video, he's on a different level than right. I am. Right. And you got, once you realize that and you, you move with that and you give that person the respect that they deserve and they worked hard for, they'll right. respond. And you're right. You're on a different level than folks that are just emailing out the blue. I love how you put it, Ill, what you, ill-informed email. <laughs> I love that. I love that because I've gotten those too. I've gotten those ill-informed emails as well. Ill-informed text messages and DMs from people who are like, yo, man, you know, can you help me do this thing? And I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah. And you want to, but you also know, like, you be giving classes and why that shouldn't have been the approach 
and then you've already wasted your time. It's no different too than like what the other version of this is like, oh, will you read my script, right? Yep. Will you give me notes? And then you finally, you know, get to it because reading someone's script and being a person who's been on the other side of it, you want to be thoughtful about the feedback. And then you you take all the time to take all the like sting out of the shit, but, but still make it inspirational and let them like have a marchable, actionable thing to, to consider addressing in their revision. And then they'd be like, thanks. Yeah, you know why? You, you know why this is? Because they didn't hear what they wanted to hear from you. It's great. Yeah. It's amazing. We right. should do this right now. This should be on. This should be out there. Yeah. Or or oh, I got a new draft already. It's like dog. You know. Just can... take it. Take take the L. Take the conversation as you want. I mean, because it's never really an L. If we're giving, like you said, if you're giving feedback and I'm giving feedback, anybody's giving feedback, that's a W. And yeah. take take that W and apply it to your script or to your reel or whatever it is you are asking us to to look at. And, you know, man, I appreciate you for that. I appreciate you for being real, you know, in your book and being real on this podcast and being real on, on all the things. As far as, like, anything that you said or anything I would want added, there's really nothing. I mean, I think, you know, at the end of the day, you're really good at this. And I, you know, I've answered all the stuff. And I think you've covered a lot of the bases that need to be covered for this business. And man, I, think, I appreciate you, know, you brother. No. A conversation. So I, I thank you for taking the time. Yeah, I know you're gonna edit this up, chop it up. It's a long one. Nah, I, it, I let it go, man. I let, I let it fly, man. I'm Steph Curry with the pod. I just let it <laughs> let it go. <laughs> well, see, man, I appreciate you, brother, and I I appreciate you being being a part of my peer group and being part of the group and 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 setting this up for folks. I hope you get the you know the rods and all the rest of our folks on this because it, this can be like a little time capsule actually. To yeah. be on your podcast can be a little time capsule. And, you know, and, and when you get to a space where you either want to monetize or lend it over to the DGA, they need it because, right. you know, the DGA doesn't have enough of these kind of talks with black directors that are doing it. And, right. and, and we, we need it at the DGA because people need to see that. So I thank right. you. I appreciate you, brother. Well, yo, man, Jeff Bird, let's shoot with Pete Chapman. BK Listen in the house. And learn. There it is. What's up, people? This is Pete Chapman. Follow me on Instagram and on Twitter via at Pete Chapman. Follow the pod on Facebook on our Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman official page and hit up our mailbag with questions, suggestions, or hey, donations if you're feeling like it via Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman at gmail.com. And just in case you need to know how to spell it, that's Pete with the last name C-H-A-T-M-O-N. All right. That was Mr. Jeff Bird, producing director on season two of Showtime's Yellow Jackets and, of course, a man of many more credits and talents. Uh, definitely want to thank Jeff for joining the podcast for this episode. And uh, for those of you who will be here next week, which I hope will be all of you and some new people, spread the word. We will be welcoming, we will be welcoming the uh, talented director, Valerie Weiss. Um, she has directed feature films, mixtape on Netflix, and a great deal of great television from Outer Banks to Monarch to Bull, For the People, The Rookie, The Resident, uh, Suits, Chicago Med, How to Get Away with Murder. Um, and she's also uh, a scientist. So she'll be bringing a lot of wisdom to the pod. Uh, that's backed up by degrees, y'all. So um, tune in next week. In the meantime, stay safe, spread love, and keep creating. And if you have any questions, holler at the mailbag. Peace.